As I was preparing for this morning, I thought about Robert Southey's tale, Goldilocks and the Three Bears. Now, Goldilocks and the Three Bears is not my favorite childhood story, but I thought about all Goldilocks went through as she was breaking and entering. The porridge was too hot, the porridge is too cold. This bed is too hard, this bed is too soft. And then, having found just the right porridge and just the right bed, she didn't get to enjoy her stay for very long because three very unhappy, very surprised bears came home. The moral of the story is your actions can hurt others. And in the nursery rhyme, Goldilocks is clearly trespassing. <laughs> she knocks, she hears no answer, she enters, she helps herself to the bear's porridge, sits in their chairs, and finally falls asleep on their comfiest bed. Goldilocks had made herself right at home, but she never considers whose house she is in or when they will be returning home. But the second, more deeper, philosophical discussion is about how Goldilocks is motivated by selfishness. See, in the story, Goldilocks tries three of everything until she finds something that's just right. Goldilocks feels this sense of entitlement, even with things that do not belong to her. And she's not satisfied, even with the slightest discomfort. She quickly discards this and that, trying to find the perfect thing. I think that it's safe to say that sometimes we can have that same attitude towards church. You know, one of the things that we uh, would say about church is perhaps that the music is too old or too new or too fast or too slow or the people are way too friendly or too cold. The congregation is too big or it's too small. When it suits us, we'll attend church. When we need comfort. When we want to hear words of hope. But if things are going well, we find church an interruption from everything else we want to do. In short, we expect church to be there for us when we need it and to be all things to all people. In our passage today, it appears that the church, still in its infancy, has dropped the ball on ministering to a group of people. And there's a conflict that occurs because of it. Acts chapter 6 says, Now in these days when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of disciples and said, it is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicolaus, a, pro, a proselyte of Antioch. They set, these they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid hands on them. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. You know, as we've been reading for the past couple weeks, the church has been seeing rapid growth. But starting in verse 1, we see that there is now a complaint that has brought before church leaders. And what's the problem? Well, the Greek members of the church felt that their widows were being discriminated against. So a conflict arises. People's needs aren't being met. And then how is the conflict handled? Well, we hope in a very mature and very biblical way. Because what would Goldilocks do? She'd say, hey, my needs aren't being met, so I'm leaving. Right? I'm going to the next option. But in this situation, it's good to see that this oversight is addressed and the 12 get to it right away. The text says the 12 summoned the full number of the disciples. That means the conflict was acknowledged. The 12 acknowledged the problem. 
They didn't live in denial. They admitted that there was a problem. You know, all too often people will grumble in silence. Something is wrong and they feel that their needs are not being met and they just sit there and they hope that maybe things will get better. Somebody will notice my discomfort. Meanwhile, nobody addresses the issue so that one day that person throws up their hands and says, well, I guess nobody cares. Well, maybe nobody cares because nobody knows. From the text, we don't know how much time has passed from the rumblings of verse 1 to the meeting of verse 2, but we do know the conflict was dealt with in an appropriate manner. And it was dealt with in an appropriate manner because a critically important attitude was present, and that was respect. The conflict was respected. The Twelve respected those who were upset. They did not label them as troublemakers. They did not dismiss their concern. They respected their need, and they understood that this was an issue that needed to be addressed. The Twelve also respected the entire church and valued their input too. They had enough wisdom to know that this particular issue needed to be brought to a larger group of people for a decision. They came up with a proposed solution, and the text says, and what they said pleased the gathering. So what was behind this pleasing response? Trust, right? The solution was trusted. They suggested a course of action. It was well received by those present. Trust is a very important thing. It's also a very fragile thing. I would suggest this morning that trust and respect they are two sides of the same coin. Respect can lead to trust, and trust can deepen respect. But if one is damaged, the other can be also. The people clearly trust their church leaders. There had been a bond of respect through the Holy Spirit's work, and I would add that developed as the Twelve and the believers worked together for a common purpose and a common mission. The church believed in one another, because of their faith and their faith in God through Christ, and they continuously made this work together. The conflict that arose from this issue in the passage could have been serious if it hadn't been resolved the way it was. It could have created a division in the church, and the work of the church would have suffered. So because it was made aware, and the people trusted and respected their leaders, the conflict is resolved, the congregation is pleased, and in addition, the text says, and the word of God continued to increase, and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith, meaning the church moved forward and even more people came to Christ. Now, I want to stop here for a moment and just make a couple of observations. We can read a story like this when things work out, and it really seems very neat and tidy, doesn't it? It's kind of like the conflict that we see on a TV show. You know, the kid comes home and confesses that he did something wrong, and the parents forgive him, and immediately everybody goes out for ice cream, and you know, the whole thing is resolved in 30 minutes, and we think, yeah, real life is much more messy than that. But this is real life. Why did this work so well? How come nobody's feelings got hurt? How come nobody stormed off? Well, because we see cooperation taking place. You know, we mentioned last week that the church is a family. And so we have to work and operate like a family. One of the things that uh, my wife and I tell our own kids is, this is not a restaurant. Meaning, our family is not composed of wait staff and customers. Instead, we all help and we all serve. Ephesians 4 says that we should be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And notice, in our story, there's cooperation on both sides. Church leadership cooperated with the congregation by acknowledging that there was a problem and they called a meeting to deal with it. The congregation cooperated with leadership and they agreed to the plan. Cooperation is a necessary step if you want to resolve conflict. Both sides have to come together. And second, there was great communication. 
right? Communication took place. Communication is so important to conflict resolution. I mean, just go back to our example of the church being a family. If, if your husband isn't picking up his socks off the ground and it's driving you crazy, guess what? He's going to keep doing it until you say something. Proverbs 25 says, A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in a setting of silver. Good communication involves both being understood and both understanding. It also means directly communicating with the person that you need to talk to, face to face. Not talking to other people who are not involved. That's gossip. Gossip is when person B and person C have a conflict. But instead of working it out between themselves, one of those persons draws in person A. That person's not involved. And that person can't help. Now, the Bible makes it clear that in the church, in our story, the Greek members were upset because they had a group of women who weren't having their needs being met. So they communicated that directly to the church leaders. They told exactly who needed to hear the message. The disciples then communicated the plan and they were heard. And as I got to about here in my sermon prep, I kept thinking about how ironic it is to be writing a sermon about healthy communication and building community in a wake of a very divisive election. And you know, I think this election and the candidates is not the reason that we are feeling isolated and divided. I think it's even deeper than that. Recently, I heard about the back porch phenomenon. What is that? Well, it's the fact that the way we build houses has changed. And if we build houses differently, then we build community differently. We have gone from building houses with expansive front porches, as we used to do in the 20th century, to building homes with no front porches, but instead with back porches and we surround it with a fence. See, when I think about back when America was great, it was back when Mark Twain told stories. It was back when Andy Griffin took his son fishing. A time when you sat on your front porch, you spoke to your neighbors, you interacted with them and their dogs and their kids on a regular basis. But as a society, we've lost that familiarity and we have moved from the front porch to the back porch. And now we have become suspicious of each other. Looking back, we might think that this all started with the war on terror or that it started with September 11th, but you'd be wrong. People who study our behavior believe that us being divisive and fearful started back in 1964. It's the year we got involved in Vietnam. It's the year the Civil Rights Act was signed into law. It's the year Martin Luther King Jr. won his Nobel Peace Prize. It's the year the Beatles were on the Ed Sullivan Show. That was the year that we all started to become glued to our televisions, glued to the news telling us how to live and what to be afraid of. For instance, a growing number of Americans say that reducing crime should be our top priority. They want the president and Congress to address that. Six out of 10 Americans want that. But the truth is, it's already happened. Violent crime has been going down since 1993. Right now, according to the FBI and studies by the Justice Department, we are experiencing 50% less crime in 2024 than we were 31 years ago. Robbery is down 74%, aggravated assault is down 39%, murder is down 34%. We are all safer today than we were 31 years ago. So why do we think crime is up? 
because having the latest breaking news right at your fingertips has made us all more aware of all the bad things that are happening all over the world. The news is breeding fear, and the internet is breeding hate. Now, technology has made it easier for us to say something from behind a computer screen, something that we wouldn't say to somebody face to face. And so we log into our computers and we start attacking and criticizing and tearing somebody down who doesn't agree with us. Then, because we get so used to doing that on social media and we watch it all the time in the news, it becomes a lot easier to get out into the world and do the same thing with strangers and people who don't look like us. Which brings us to where we are now, seemingly only interacting with each other in hurtful ways. Right now we're seeing this most blatantly in politics, but it's not just politics. We get ugly with each other over everything, whether it's race or religion or creed or sports, everything. And the results are the bonds of community are breaking. TV, computers, other electronic devices have caused us to turn more inward. And as a result, we are more worried and we are more anxious. Just think for a moment about a time in your life when you felt like you were really part of a tight-knit community. Could have been your college dorm, your platoon, your first job, a study group. Remember how it felt to do life with other people? People you'd hang out with on a regular basis, people you'd eat together with, people who helped you study, people that you laughed and cried with, and yes, people you even got mad with. Don't you miss that kind of interaction today? We all know what true community feels like because there was a time when our friendships were more sacred, when friendships were more holy. And that's why fostering community in our lives is so important. Community is special. It's sacred. It's the way that we all connect more deeply, not just with one another, but with God. You know, in John 17, Jesus prayed for you. He did. He prayed for you, and he said, I in them and you in me, that they, meaning you, may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you love me. Wow. Jesus said that our relationship with each other strengthens our relationship with him. So what if we looked at every relationship as something that connects us more fully to God? How much more would we seek out healthy community? How much more would we work toward building healthy relationships in our lives? Community matters because community helps us experience God and community helps us connect to God. Whether it's the relationship you have with spouse or family or friends or neighbors, each of us can look to a certain time in our lives when our bonds with other people were life-giving, holy. We know how important this is. We feel the loneliness now and the emptiness when our circumstances have now caused us to lose friendships. So we should be doing everything we can to build community not just in our own lives, but in the world around us. If the personal relationships we build in our lives are the source of peace for us, imagine how the world would change if we did it on an even bigger scale. And you're right, it's not going to be easy. There will be more roadblocks now than there ever had been before. If the world is all sitting on their back porch with their faces buried in their phones, how are we ever going to get them to look up? How are we ever going to get them to the front yard? How are we going to ever put neighbors face to face? 
I honestly, truly believe that the reason there is so much anxiety in the world right now is because there is so much hate. And we have all allowed ourselves to get caught up in it. Every single one of us. We don't easily and readily forgive. Instead, we hold grudges. We harbor resentment. We approach people with fear and suspicion rather than friendliness and generosity. We get caught up in the name-calling and the mudslinging. Even if it's behind closed doors, it's still a hate-filled mindset. And it contributes to a wider problem. And here's the thing. We are all part of this system and it is undermining our unity in Christ, and it is tearing apart our communities. As Christians, we must begin to model something different. We need to start doing something new. Jesus had something new. He said, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. And by this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. See, I believe that first church in Acts was able to listen and to help resolve this issue because they honestly loved each other. And Jesus says love is central to who we are as Christians. After all, it's because of God's love that he gave his only son. But here's the thing. Not only should Christ's love be in us, it should flow out of us as we interact with other people. Because lately, I've heard, you can't be a Christian and vote that way. But Jesus said, the thing you can't do is get caught up in the hate that is filling our world. If you want peace in our lives, then we need to be guided by love for others. But not just surface love, we need deep, risky, abiding, sacrificial love. Instead of sitting behind a computer screen, we need to be out walking the streets of our neighborhood and praying for all these houses. We need to get to know people and listen to them and learn their hearts. This is tough stuff. I realize that. But when I think of Jesus' teachings, I don't think of him as being an easy teacher. I don't think of his lessons as being easy. I don't think being a Christian is easy. Romans 12 says, If possible, as far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. The Greek word for all means all. Each of us has a part to play in peace. And each of us has a part to play in love. Let's pray. Lord, right now our prayers go outward and inward. As they go outward, we think of our neighbors, the people who live right next door to us, the people who live across the street from us, the people who live down the street from us, as we walk and drive through these neighborhoods, we pray for these homes and these people, the people that live behind these doors, the people that look out those windows, the people who are sitting on their back porch. We pray for more people to walk out the front door, to sit on their front porch, and for us to be a community, not just Montgomery, not just Walden, not just Texas, move the people of the United States out to their front yards. Not front yards filled with signs, front yards filled with love, front yards filled with community, front yards filled with neighbors, sharing stories and sharing life together. And Lord, our prayers go inward as, you pr as I pray for myself, for my own hang-ups, my own inhibitions, my own fears. I pray that you would quiet those voices because those belong to the world. Darkness is trying to get me to hate my brother. Darkness wants me to divide myself from my brother. Divideness, darkness wants me to look at my neighbor suspiciously and to think the worst of them. 
Help me to see your children the way you see them. Not as a people divided, but as a people united. Help me to see the people in my world as neighbors and friends and as brothers and sisters in Christ. Change my worldview so that I can change the world. Amen. Hey, thanks for coming out and worshiping with us this morning. Of course, I would remind you, uh, go to church. (laughs) Go to church on Sunday morning. Find a local church and attend. Find a local church and serve. It doesn't have to be the best church. I know we walk in those church buildings and we think this church is too big or this church is too small. This church is too hard. This church is too soft. And you want to find one that's just right. There are no just right churches. Don't be Goldilocks. Be a worshiper and a server of God. Be a person that builds community. Find a local church made up of your neighbors, made up of your community, and pour into that church. Serve their children, serve their elderly, and lift your hands and sing praises to God for all the blessings that he has done for you. Grow in Christ. Grow in fellowship. I'll see you guys next week.